Well, good morning, friends. Good. It's good to see you're awake and ready to, to hear something really worthwhile. If Jesus were, I don't know if it's possible, to quietly come into this room and sit next to you, what would you want to say to him? What would you want to say to him? I reckon we'd have hundreds of questions we'd want to ask him. You know, some of my questions, if he sat next to me, would be, you know, how old is the world? And uh, what is heaven actually like? Or, you know, is my grandmother in heaven? Or, you know, when will be my first day in heaven? You know, you, you've probably got questions that you would have. And after you've asked your questions of Jesus, what do you think he would say to you? Stop doing that or this? Do you think he'd say that? No, no. He'd say, I love you. I died for you. You are so precious to me. And I am with you in whatever you are going through right now. And so the passage we're looking at this morning uh, is, uh, is part of the, the last of Jesus' prayers before he went to the cross. And in these final hours, we see their significant words as he's in, in the upper room. And I actually think they fit into the category of this is what you need to hear from Jesus today. Well... We've said uh, in, in recent uh, sermons, this prayer is really the real Lord's prayer. Uh, as the one that we're ta- they taught his disciples, uh, asked for forgiveness. Well, Jesus doesn't need to ask for forgiveness, he didn't sin. But this prayer is about praying for the unity that we have with God, but especially focusing on the unity of God's people. Now, the gift of praying... To be heard by our Heavenly Father is an absolutely priceless privilege. But we forget sometimes it's a priceless privilege. I'll get it. We've been looking at over the last couple of weeks in in John 17, and, and in this prayer, Jesus prayed for himself that he'd be glorified, and, and then he prayed for the uh, 11 apostles, that they might be set apart to do the job that God has called them to do to make a difference. And now, this morning, we come to the passage here of the privilege of hearing Jesus pray for believers, not only the ones in the upper room, but those down the track. And it's amazing that we are you are, on Jesus' heart, hours before he was to die. He was praying for you and me. And this is what Jesus would say to you, I think, if he sat down next to you and were to talk to you this morning. And what does Jesus ask for in this prayer? He's praying for believers in verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. Look at this. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. He prays everyone who's going to become a Christian and to put their faith in Jesus as revealed by the apostles' message or testimony. And he's praying for you and me as we hear that testimony, to believe. And you and me and other believers, that we might give glory to God in the end and, and that we will be one. That's how he's, he's sort of highlighting it. This is profound. God has called us in various ways. If I was to hear your testimony, how you became a Christian, it would be different from someone else. But primarily, God has called you and you've responded and you responded to the message of salvation that only Jesus offers. And he prays that we will receive, he's praying in the future, the apostles' message of salvation. 
and, uh, and it's about the truth of Jesus. You see, the first thing about being a Christian is not that we sip coffee together on the porch or we, um, we turn up in a certain building. The thing that unites us is it's in the gospel of Jesus Christ and that we've responded to him. That's the glue, the Lord Jesus and the message that has come to us. And it is this that makes us one with God and makes us one with God's people. Christian unity is a unity of truth based on the Lord Jesus and it affects our minds and our hearts and and we're persuaded by this message of Jesus, we're told. Now, this gospel message is what Jesus had been organising, we see in John's Gospels. From, you know, from chapters 14 to 16, he, uh, he said to them that the Spirit will bring to mind what they you know, have seen and record it, and that everyone will be able to read and hear it in the near future and in the distant future in history. And that is what has happened. This message has been recorded over centuries and millions of people have come to Christ and responded to Jesus. Now, he's talking about unity and how that responding to Christ and it's interwoven. And the unity in Christ is at the heart a deep and strong thing. And it's not bound by denominations. You know, it's, oh, you know, I'm in this denomination and that means I'm unified. Well, denominations are only an aid to fellowship. Well, it's not, you know, the, the big uh, thing perhaps uh, in the last, you know, 50 years was the ecumenical movement and it's attempting to bring people together and basically what they do is they, they throw out any throw away any sort of beliefs that might conflict with other people and they're left with very little in the end. It's not a very good unity, really. The gospel is sort of washed down or away. But we are united in the apostolic truth of the gospel, of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? And so this is the glue of us here today. And so we read in verse 22, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. And Jesus said, I've given you, I've given you the, the splendor, the, the truth, the, the revelation of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, the, the identity of who Jesus is that unites us here today and every day. And this unity is relational. Uh, we read in verse 21 in that prayer, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. They are one, he says, as you and I, the Father and Son, are one. And Jesus is praying for what we, I would call a relational unity, not only to, to God, but to each other. And the relational unity is because we belong to Jesus. We are part of his forever family. And Jesus also uses an illustration, what I would say, organic unity in two chapters prior, about the branch and the vine. So Christianity is organic and relational. It's belonging to Jesus intimately, intimately like a, a branch is linked to a vine. It would be sad to say that a married couple are only or just unified together because they have a house, they live in the same house, or they have a mortgage, or they have tasks that they share together. Sure, that might be part of a marriage relationship, but it's not defined by that. Marriage is a unity of oneness in love. And we, by the Holy Spirit, are united in God's family, both relationally and organically, in the truth of Jesus 
for the love of him. Well, the third thing that we want to say from John 17 is, is uh, particularly in verse 23, uh, moving towards complete unity. Unity is not uh, in its final state. Jesus says to the Father in his prayer, I in them and you in me, so that they may be, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus isn't saying, look, um, I just want a little bit of minimal unity. No, 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 he's not happy with a little bit. In fact, he goes on further and he says he wants our unity to grow deeper and deeper and deeper. And and that is the the one aspect I I want to say, sometimes we don't feel, and I don't reflect upon, what is the basis of our unity here in the church? It is here this morning. God says, because we are his family, there is unity with us. And by the grace of God, it is based in the truth of the Lord Jesus. But we still have more room to grow, and uh, our unity and knowledge and understanding of each other has to grow more and more, he says. And, and Jesus is praying that our unity here in this church and in all churches will continue to grow. Now, it's a very sad thing when a family has the same surname. but they're not talking to each other or relating to each other. They are separated and they are divided. And Jesus asks in the family of God that to increase the unity. And how does that increase in unity comes? By understanding the message, the word of God received. The Spirit of God does his work and where we will see Jesus one day face to face and we'll understand it perfectly and our unity will be great then, just like you know, Janice Duke now. But believe it or not, when we fall on our knees before Jesus in heaven, every piece of difference, every piece of disagreement that we have will be absolutely obliterated. It will be a non-issue. We'll be caught up in, in the perfection and the truth and the love of Christ that day. All right? We've got a long way to go. But what about the purpose of this unity? In his final hours, Jesus prays that all his people throughout history would be one. The Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit are all one, but they are different. And they complement each other and they, and they have different roles. And there is diversity in the Godhead, but still unity. Yes, just like Jesus and the Father are one in love, we are also, we're told, one with Christ. How? Through his death and resurrection. And we are meant to be different. We are meant to be diverse in our unity. University is, uh, unity is not uh, uniformity. We are to complement each other as we live and serve the risen Lord Jesus. We are entitled to have different opinions. We're entitled to vote for different politicians. We're entitled to have our likes and dislikes because that's who we are. If a marriage was based on being the same, it would be a pretty boring marriage, all right? As we proclaim Jesus to our friends and family and the generation that we live in. So if Jesus were to sit next to you right now in this church, he would say he loves you so much and he died for you. He rose again from the dead. This is the Jesus that was revealed then and would be revealed to you now. And your mission today and every day is to love, love God and be united and love God's people. And you need to hear that because it's so important. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love you have shown to us as revealed to us in the Lord Jesus. We thank you that sin and death has been defeated and we are now part of your forever family, your church, your bride. We thank you, Father, for this prayer Jesus prayed for us, that we will hold on to the truth of your word and be making progress with your spirit. And would you please continue to bless this wonderful church here, that, that our love and unity for you would grow, that, your, that our love for each other will grow more and more, and that we might draw others to you. And so, Lord, we, we submit our lives and your church here to you now, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.